può andare in chat e avrà tutte le istruzioni del caso. Eh, per sentire questa di discussione internazionale che è praticamente l'ottava sessione della Cyber Economy Around the World. Good afternoon everybody. Uh, good morning to our colleague uh, in, in chat uh, in, in Boston in this moment. My name is Daniele Rosa and I work as foreign correspondent for Affari Italiani in USA. I'm really, really proud to be here to moderate this uh, discussion panel in the third edition of Silver Economy. First of all, a sincere welcome to our kind audience and our international guests. Together, they will give us an expert inside vision into the world of silver people in their different countries. Allow me to introduce the protagonist of our panel. First, welcome to Jerome Pignet, president of Silver Eco. Hello, good morning, Second, good afternoon. Welcome, good, good afternoon. Welcome to Mario Otillo, president of Europe Global Coalition on Aging, managing director of Lantern Group. Good afternoon. Uh, we are waiting for and the third speaker, Irina calderon libal that probably will arrive in, in the first minute. So the first speaker, welcome to Sofia Dimitridis, Research Fellow at International Longevity Center UK. Hello, welcome. Lovely to be here. Yes, and last but not least, Nicola Palmarini. Direttore del National Innovation Center for Aging, NICA di Boston. Thank you, Daniele. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Okay. okay. So, uh, immediately we enter, we have to enter immediately in the debate. Uh, and so, I would like to give the, the, the word to our first speaker, is Jerome Pignet. Please, Jerome. Yes. Okay, so um, I, I have to share a document. I will try it, if it works. Yes. Can, can you see it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, perfect. So good afternoon. Thanks a lot for inviting me to this uh, great forum. I'm very proud of it. I'm uh, Jérôme Pignan, I'm the president of uh, On Media Company. We are uh, publishing silvereco.org, the website dedicated to aging well and silver economy. Um, we also uh, publish um, the uh, National uh, Directory for Silver Economy Stakeholders. It's a huge book uh, with uh, more than 2,500 companies and associations um, uh, who are working on the silver economy field. And this um, uh, directory still um, exists also in um, an online version, and we will launch very soon and international directory online uh, on our website. And uh, last but not least, as you say, uh, we organize um, from um, 12 years now Silver Night, which is the National Silver Eco Trophies Awards. And uh, we uh, published uh, two, three years ago the Silver Eco and Edging Well International Awards. That took place in Tokyo uh, one year before. All those two events, we become uh, to one event, and it will take place in the famous city in the south of France, in Cannes, in the Palais des Festivals. But unfortunately, because of COVID situation, uh, it won't take place in 2020, it will take place in 2021. So uh, you asked me to, to talk about a little bit about civil economy in France. So civil economy in France is an official uh, sector. Um, uh, what about in a few words, what about silver economy? It's a question of, of new paradigm. It's a question of seeing the glass half full instead of uh, seeing the half empty glass. Um, so the idea is to change our mind between dependence to autonomy, disease to prevention, stigmatization to design for all, for example, exclusion to inclusion, inactive people to engage people. This is the main idea of silver economy. It's a unique we are living nowadays a unique demographic transition. We are not homo erectus, we are not homo sapiens, 
we are not homo numericus, we are all homo senectus. That means that we are all going to live uh, in, a, in, a, in a society uh, in which a lot of people are getting older and older. Um, so, in this environment, a lot of fields are involved uh, on the cyber economy sectors. Of course, caregivers, nutrition, vision, medical, uh, service at homes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not, it's not a, the unique list. There is a lot, a lot of, of, of things that could be added to this list. We are also talking about sexuality, sports, culture, leisure, uh, when we talk about cyber economy nowadays in France. So I will stop this, this short presentation. How to, to cut it? I don't know. Like this? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It works. So, um, sure. Sure. you asked you ask me to talk about cyber economy in France. It starts after those short words of introduction. Um, how it starts in France? It starts in 2012. Uh, we were about four to six people in the, the, the office of Michel Delaunay. Michel Delaunay was the French minister in charge of elderly people and aging well. And we explained the interest of creating um, an economic sector based on demographic transition. So we made a lot of meetings, we made a lot of, of, of um, um, reports about this. And one year after, in, 20, in 2013, sorry, um, after the different reports we have made, cyber economy was officially, it, it, the, the, the big and really important word, was officially launched by the French government as an official, um, um, I would say that, an official um, sector. Uh, and supported by the government, not supported through money, but supported through the idea that this sector is, uh, um, um, I would say that, uh, a, a very important sector for the uh, economy in the near future. So a lot of association, a lot of uh, companies, um, industries, groups, professional units are nowadays involved in this, in this um, official sector. And all those uh, uh, companies bring together um, uh, are every day thinking about new products, new services, um, uh, in order to 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 create new uh, new uh, new um, new products and services for the aging well. So a lot of new ideas are launched every day. A lot of new startups are going to be launched in cyber economy in France. And it's more or less 300,000 um, new employees that we are expecting from this sector and uh, 130 billion euro that we are nowadays expecting in, in cyber economy in France. So the market is here. Um, a lot of people are engaged in this market. And um, um, the fact is that a lot of, of companies are targeting this, uh, this market. And when I talk about market, it's not a, a bad word. Uh, I'm also talking about consumers uh, when, when we talk about all elderly people and old people. It's not, it's not uh, the, bad, the bad part of the, the marketing, you know. I'm always saying that uh, when I was young, my marketing professor told me, no, no, uh, sorry, no, um, no parking, no business. I don't know if you remember this, this famous word, no parking, no business. In cyber economy, I, I suggest no ethics, no business. If there is no a minimum of ethics, the business will not appear. So it, it is one of the golden rules uh, of the cyber economy in France. Very, very, absolutely very important. Absolutely very important. You must, you must consider that in a... Sorry? No, it is very important the, the word ethic because yeah, yeah. In, 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 in our country, in Italy, uh, sometimes someone people ask to the, to the whole people, the, the, the senior, uh, that don't produce too close in, in, in the home <laughs> during the COVID-19 because they are not productive. So that is, is okay. Is okay. Uh, in, 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 the, in, this, in this case, you, you said that the silver economy is an official, is official um, state. Yes. In France. Oh, okay. Yeah, there is two, two ministers in charge of, uh, at the head of this economy, the um, health minister, 
and also the um, uh, industry and financial minister. Okay. okay. So there is an organization that is in charge of thinking about how to create and how to build together this uh, this uh, silver economy field. And, uh, and how is the, the situation in France for the silver people during this COVID-19? Which is the, the real situation? The situation is terrific because of, uh, of course, uh, because uh, uh, how, how is uh, the the work of the state? We all work together in order to uh, um, imagine new solution uh, in order to fight against loneliness. The main problem is loneliness. So we we imagine a lot of solutions dedicated to 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 fight against loneliness at home okay. and in elderly houses. And I, some connection is not so good. The connection in this moment. Yeah, I don't it seems hear to. you very much, very bad. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's a little bit. Okay. Okay. J Jerome and. Um, about the situation of the hospital in this period in 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 France, in your country, about the the, the pandemic, in particular that, that uh, affected the, all the old people. Which yes. Could you hear me? Yes. You hear now, me? Now, yes. Okay. So the the yes. COVID situation is, uh, is uh, dramatic. Stop and go. Stop and go. Sorry, sorry about that. Maybe, maybe I will try later to okay. answer the question. Is a, a, so uh, I ask you how is the situation in the hospital about the pandemic situation, in particular for the elderly people? The situation in hospital is the same, I think, uh, uh, situation in, in Italy or all over Europe. Uh, there is some bug. No, it's okay for you. You, have, you are, understand me? No. The video. No, okay. It's, it's so stop good. it. <laughs> I see only. I see only your face, but don't understand. <laughs> don't hear nothing. Okay, no, no, I have cut the video. Maybe the, the only the sound is okay. Okay, okay, in this way, see, yes, okay. Okay, so the situation on the hospital, I think it's the uh, same situation. I, I ask you how we are the... Yeah, understood, understood. The the situation is the same, uh, I think, in all over Europe okay. uh, regarding the hospital. There's a lot of people and a lot of elderly people in hospitals. The main problem is uh, because of the COVID situation, every people need to stay at home. We are not allowed to go to work. We are uh, uh, obliged to work at home. Uh, so a lot of people and all elderly people fe feel really, how to say that, lonely at home. Uh, and there is a big problem regarding loneliness. Uh, people that are living in elderly houses, it's not possible to to see them, to touch them, to, to give a kiss to them. Uh, and this creates a lot of trouble, uh, uh, cognitive trouble to, uh, to elderly people. That's why uh, we in France distribute a lot of tablets, uh, you know, tablets uh, in elderly houses, tablets to elderly people in order to give them the possibility to, to, to make some phone calls and video calls with the family. Yes, if, if I well understood, is uh, more or less uh, that's the same situation that we have in Italy. Only in Italy we have a, a, a situation that become more dramatic for the pressure of the media that every day uh, give a pressure pressure to the people very 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 strong. And so we have a lot of people that go directly to the hospital and don't ask to the doctor before. And, uh, nowadays, it, nowadays, I think it, it, it's finished nowadays, this in France. You cannot go to the hospital just in order to make a, a, a check, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, there, is no, there is no problem with, at, at the hospital, 
you are not allowed to go to the hospital because you you are, you think you are, you've got the, the COVID, but you only think about it. Previously, you have to go to make a test, and the test is not making directly at the hospital. So this is not a problem. But the, the focus on elderly people, uh, the fact is this COVID attacks mainly uh, elderly people by the end. So this is the first health problem. But the big problem is also the the, the social problem because of loneliness uh, about uh, um, the, the, the older people, the loneliness at home. And the French government work a lot about that. And we imagine some, some solutions. We uh, focus on uh, non-profit uh, association in order to provide their services to help people feel not feel uh, loneliness at home. This is the main uh, the main issue. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Thank you very much, Jerome. Uh, now I, I would like to to ask to Sofia Dimitriadis from the UK. How is the situation about uh, this country in? Uh, and the situation of the silver economy, situation of the silver economy and the health care. Thank you. Yes. Um, and thank you. Thank you for, for letting me be here. I'm really happy. Um, so, yes, I guess it is quite similar to other countries. Can you hear me OK? Um, yeah, yeah, it's quite similar to other countries. Yeah. I, I would say for the UK, what we're finding is I think we have manage to kind of manage the situation in hospitals so that we're not having significant overcapacity in hospitals. Um, but there's been a lot of fear that that would happen. But I think generally speaking, we're on the brink, but we're OK there. Um, but what, where we've seen a really, really negative situation happening is has been in care homes. And care homes in the UK have been drastically underfunded for, for, for many, many years. This has been an ongoing problem. And uh, yeah, that's something I'll talk about maybe in the presentation, but it's a really serious issue in the UK. Um, and I think when we when COVID happened, actually, we were seeing significantly, really significantly high death rates in care homes. Um, often the, the, the deaths in these homes were the last to be reported, so we weren't even aware about them early on. Um, and I think that's partly because it's already been underfunded. There were you know, already a shortage of workers there in that intersector anyway. And then when COVID hit, it just, it really tipped this on the head. So there's a lot of debates in the UK right now about, you know, what are we going to do about the care sector? Um, yeah, and, and with hospitals, again, it's still on a, a very precarious situation, but slightly better, I would say, than, than the situation in care homes. And the, and the, and the government help the, the silver people or, or not? In, in economic term? Um, I'm not sure that obviously we've um, had lockdown like the rest of, you know, the rest of Europe, but we were quite late to do that. And I think, um, you know, it is quite worrying because at the beginning there was a lot of a kind of some really quite negative rhetoric sometimes that you would hear, I mean, not from the government, but that would come up kind of, you know, really pivoting the, you know, really talking about, you know, we need to protect the economy versus protecting old people. But whereas, you know, of course, the whole point of this conference is highlighting that older people do contribute to the economy. And it was almost kind of this rhetoric that was, um, com you know, putting those as if they're at odds with each other and not recognizing that older people can, you know, the, the significant contributions they make to the economy and society. Um, and I think that was part of why lockdown was delayed in the UK. I think there was this kind of rhetoric that maybe, um, you know, will protect the economy um, over the expense of this. And I think that, you know, in hindsight, many people think that wasn't a too good idea and actually was, you know, more detrimental to the economy later on because we've had to, you know, we, we weren't able to, to, to emerge from lockdown as quickly. Um, you know, look at New Zealand, they've I think they've done relatively really well. So I think there was this rhetoric and a lot of people are saying we shouldn't be putting that at odds with each other. Um, yes, that's, a, that's probably my point there. Okay. okay. Do, do you have your presentation? Do you have a one presentation probably? Yes, yes, I do. Yes. Shall I um, share my slides? Um, great, I'll do that. Okay, okay, it's okay. Great. Great. Awesome. So, thinking of 10, 10 minutes. Um, okay, so I'll try not to go over. Just 
And so, no more than 10 minutes, no more than 10. Yes, no more than 10. Great. Um, so thank you again. And my name is Sophia. I'm a research fellow at the ILC. I'm really happy to be here today. And I'm just going to talk about the key findings from our recent report, Health Equals Wealth, the Global Longevity Dividend, which focuses on G20 economies. Um, and just if you're not sure who ILC is, we're a think tank based in the UK focusing on the impact of an aging population on society. So we'll focus on that issue. So just to summarise, um, we have a very negative view around ageing the economy. We've seen that actually talked about during COVID, and we often fixate on the economic costs of ageing. And in doing so, we forget the significant economic contributions that older, older people make. And what we find is across the G20, older people are contributing significantly both to the economy and to society, and these contributions are growing as our populations age. But Although these are significant, we have the opportunity to maximise these further, and this is because previous research has identified a number of avoidable barriers that prevent older people from contributing, but also there's significant variation in these contributions and these trends across countries, so we can learn from this. Um, there's a lot more we can do, and we're going to particularly talk about the role of health. So if I first start with the labour market, what we're seeing is that older people are increasingly working for longer, and we're seeing this in most G20 economies. And actually, what we find is that the employment rates at ages 50 to 69 are actually expected to nearly catch up with those at younger ages by 2035. There's a really significant shift going on. And this, combined with the fact that the population is ageing, uh, means that our workforce is ageing, and this is happening in every G20 economy. So we're becoming more reliant on older workers, and I think the key question is to think, how can we support an ageing workforce to be as productive as possible, ensure that older workers have the same opportunities of people of all ages, training opportunities of people you know, across the age, age spectrum, um, and ensure that people can be fil fulfilled if they're working for longer, so they can remain happy and fulfilled at work. And that's a really important question. Um, not letting me go to the next slide. Uh, the next. Um, for some reason, it's not letting me go to the next slide. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry okay. about that. So what we're seeing is that as people are working for longer, they're earning more. On an average, across the G20, every third dollar is earned by someone aged 50 and over. And these, uh, these earnings are actually growing in importance to the economy, so to GDP and to, to, to total earnings overall in, in many G20 economies. But there is significant variation across countries, and we see that this variation is mainly linked to whether we're seeing trends in longer working lives. So are people working for longer or not? And so we can see the real economic benefit uh, from the countries that are you know, tackling the barriers to working in later life, supporting people to be able to work for longer. And to give you an example, if G20 economies supported older people to work at the same rate as Iceland, we find that this could add around 7% to GDP across the G20. So a huge economic gain here. And, and it's important to note that this would benefit all generations if we could tackle any barriers to working in later life. There is a misperception that if people are working for longer, that can take away the job opportunities of younger people. But actually, if they're working more, they've got more money to spend, and their spending can support the job opportunities of people across the economy. And there's a lot of evidence to support this, despite a lot of rhetoric on the contrary. If we turn to the consumer, consumer market, what we're seeing is that, is that old, as older people are earning more, they have more money to spend. And as there are more older people, because the population is aging, older people's consumption is growing, but also their consumption as a share of the consumer market. Um, and we're actually seeing that across the G20, this, this consumption is really, really significant. So, and it's on, significant on a global scale. So older households headed by someone aged 50 and over spend around 9.7 trillion US dollars. That's more than the GDP of Japan, Australia, Canada, and Brazil combined. So really big numbers. This is a huge export opportunity. So we're becoming, the key point really here is that our economies are becoming increasingly reliant on older consumers. So businesses need to think about how the consumer market is changing and adapt and understand the diversity of an aging population. But also for governments, if they want to support consumption in their economies, you know, are there any barriers that prevent old people from consuming? Um, 
how can we tackle that? And that is increasingly important, you know, going forward, but also now as we we recover from COVID. And apart from kind of the market contributions that we've just talked about, older people also contribute significantly to society via unpaid contributions, like volunteering in the community, caring for a loved one or looking after grandchildren. And actually, adults aged 65 and over actually spend more time compared to other ages volunteering or, or caring for a loved one who's unwell. So while many people at this age stop working, these ages actually do stop work and we do see that they're not stopping contributing and they're really contributing significantly by these unpaid contributions that are often forgotten. And in fact, what we found is that the unpaid contributions of people aged 50 and over in the EU um, actually amount to around 1.4% um, of GDP. So that actually exceeds what the EU spends on defence. So really significant, but something we don't notice because we don't measure, measure this in GDP. Um, oh God, it's just okay. sorry. Just um, no, so <laughs> we've seen um, the significant variation in these contributions across countries, and obviously there are a lot of the factors that can explain this. But a key factor may be health. And in fact, what we find is that employment rates, rates of spending, and the average time spent volunteering at older ages are all higher in countries that spend more on health as a share of GDP and have healthier older populations. And we also see that older people spend more time looking after grandchildren in countries with healthier older populations. And these results are statistically significant once uh, relevant factors have been controlled for. Um, so what we're really seeing is that health is important, you know, both for market and for non-market contributions. It can really underpin a longevity dividend. It can support older people to fulfil their economic and social uh, potential. But we find that, you know, investment in health is key, but really prevent, investing in preventative health is particularly key. And that can really maximise that link we're seeing between health and wealth. You know, if we can prevent someone from becoming ill in the first place, they can really uh, fully, fully um, participate in society and economy. And we find that an increase in prevention spending by just 0.1 percentage points is associated with a 9% increase in spending by older people per year. And to put this in perspective, this would add around 180 billion uh, to the US economy. So really big numbers. And we're seeing the similar, similarly big numbers if you look at prevention and its association with volunteering. And it's important to note that investment, investing in prevention would pay for itself, um, you know, because of that link between health and wealth. And McKinsey estimate an economic return of two to four dollars uh, for every dollar investing in improving global health, mainly via known preventative health interventions. But we need to do more. We find that preventative health spending is far too low, and in most G20 economies, it's less than 2.5%. And these budgets are the first to be cut in times of crises. We also see that health inequalities are wide and growing, but it's the most disadvantaged that is the furthest away from realising their full social and economic potential. However, the tragedy of COVID actually strengthened the case for improving prevention. It might be a unique moment for this. Highlighted the link between health and wealth. Economies have been decimated by the virus, but also countries with healthy populations, for instance, the rates may have actually been more to the virus. So there's a short-term incentive to spend on prevention, which is something we really need to be doing um, anyway. Uh, it's also not just health that's a key barrier to be contributing non-inclusive services, and the age family, age solutions. Communities. They're also barriers to many economies are doing aging populations. Really interesting to what's happening in France. So there are a lot of these policies are actually be fragmented. Um, and that the G20 leaders are making a cost of the economy. Make, taking into account that link between health and wealth 
and maybe complementing GDP with a measure that factors in health when measuring growth. We need to support work in the world. We need to support to reduce the barriers of working learning. So we need to opportunities to all growing power. Best in preventing ill health and to do more around ageing. And let's use that shift created by COVID uh, to reverse the longevity of the environment. Thank you. Okay. pharmaceutical and nutrition, and our core focus areas are really three on the silver economy, on the active and healthy aging, and on elder care giving. So, um, uh, having said uh, what we do, then how we do that, um, you can see that, that we have a quite big network of uh, partners and work uh, in partnerships uh, with uh, third parties trying to um, as much as we can uh, share multidisciplinary knowledge and insight and also of course we work in identifying some of the mega trends uh, within the mega trend of aging uh, that can be interesting for businesses um, so we talk to business and i, I think um, that's going to be the, my focus uh, today and the first message that we give them is that healthy aging is an investment and not a cost trying uh, to show uh, the theory of change that you see on slide, looking at uh, the aspects of investment and, and, and the uh, uh, benefits 
uh, that derive, including, of course, the, the societal return, all aligned with the decade of healthy aging, which is a big, um, I would say, uh, discussion that is going on in WHO, and it will be uh, there until 2030. So um, I put on slide some of the uh, age-friendly uh, the principles that um, we had developed early on with the World Economic Forum to show some of you know our mantra, our motto, if you want, for businesses looking at them ensuring an age-neutral workplace, a supportive environment, uh, fostering a, a sensitive culture, an age-sensitive culture, and, and so on and so forth. So let me enter in the second part of the conversation and, uh, and try to guide, to drive you through the story that I actually would like to tell. And the story, uh, you know, all of you know it very well. Um, we're, for the first time in the history of humanity, we are realizing the benefits of longevity and the interesting thing now is that there is a new market because a young girl that is born in London, in New York, in Tokyo will be will live to to be hundred. But that is increasingly too true if we look at uh, areas of the world, um, uh, you know, from Manila to Buenos Aires to Hanoi, and, and you name it. Uh, now, as every society society is of course uh, urbanizing and modernizing, uh, they are experiencing lower birth rates, and so that is the challenge that we are. Uh, we have to face in, in the current um, situation. So what's happening here is that there are more old than young, uh, and this is again um, something that is troubling um, uh, policymakers worldwide, but also constitute an opportunity for engagement for, for businesses. So we believe that aging society represents a new a silver economy, uh, and that's the topic of your discussions. And the opportunity lay in the things that we have to do, which are essentially three. We have to um, keep us healthier so that we can be active longer. Uh, we have to change uh, the idea of work so that we can continue to work longer, differently and in flexible ways. And that's proven even critical in times like this. But also businesses will need to reimagine how they think about the demographic opportunity of aging workforces and evolving priorities. So um, that's even better and that's even truer if we look at the healthcare crunch. Uh, as the condition of aging brings new health challenges and systems costs, there is also an opportunity and a need at political level to actually make sure that we are looking into the sustainability of systems. Um, and, you know, I, I decided to put that uh, slide, which is a bit scary, but it's a quite uh, current, you know, given the, the uh, focus uh, that, of course, all of us have right now on healthcare. So it's not doom and gloom. That's our key message here. There is, there is an unprecedented opportunity for economy and society to evolve. So let me go quickly through some of the consideration here. There are a billion of human beings on the planet over 60, and we are gonna expect this number to double by mid-century as a consequence, of course, of uh, health and medical advances. And the second billion will largely come out of markets that before were actually uh, an afterthought. So there is a marketplace, and, and, the, and this marketplace needs to be considered um, really similar to, to what we have seen already in the past, right? The bubbles uh, or the, the markets that India was representing in the 90s with the nearly 900 million consumers coming to the world stage, that Latin America representing in 2000, that the millennials are representing uh, uh, starting from uh, 2010, 2010. So uh, done right, our aging society really will become a multiplier of GDP growth, and that is what uh, we want to convey uh, to businesses because this is no different than some other mega trends that we have seen, like the information explosion, like the urbanization and, and the technology. So an interesting thing is that the politics is starting to, to, to really take aging seriously, and that's what we see as a lever as well to engage the private sector. So I will not go through all that is on slide, but what I, what I, the point I want to make is that whoever is able to take the lead in developing the appropriate high quality infrastructure to support this uh, demographic way and, of course, to conceive new products. So, whoever does that will become as successful as those that were in the forefront of the communication revolution, of the technology revolution that we have witnessed a little bit earlier on in the century. And it's an issue of geopolitics, it's an issue that countries that are able to facilitate and reap the benefits of the civil economy will see the export rights, will see their soft power increase, and the business as a key role into, into this. So a little bit of stats here. 
um, and I'll go very quickly because you may be all familiar with that, when we look at the size of the market in the United States and also the size of the market in the European Union, in particular, you know, having that uh, to the point you were saying that before, uh, Daniela, 20% uh, of the GDP um, uh, is right now represented, uh, you know, in the, in the European market. So, a couple of trends I want to cover is really like the emergence of a new consumer that we have not maybe taken into account right uh, earlier on. In fact, one of the things that uh, many have observed is that the tra traditional companies have been so focused on chasing the dollars from the millennials that they have become unaware of the fact that the most profitable, most valuable, most loyal customers are actually on a journey of transformation and becoming themselves an, an important part and model of the economy. And, and um, you see on slide some of the, of the mega trend that we try to isolate, looking at diversity within the, the, 60, the 55 plus consumer block. We're not talking anymore about the monolith here. It's not 60 plus, it's 60, 70, 80, 85. And each of them comes, each of those segments come with a specific need that has to be fulfilled. We are talking about tech savvy people. We're talking about a healthy and active population that want to keep a healthy and, uh, and, and active. We're talking about a population that is increasingly living is, uh, as the actual home of aging, again, representing a huge opportunity for businesses. So the, the focus today um, on the opportunities on age tech, and many people are considering age tech as the next big thing. So there is little doubt, basically, that the longevity market is in quite desperate need of innovation, and some venture capitalists, angel investors have already recognized the potential of the market and are ready to invest some money because maybe there could be some other unicorn there. And there are those four characteristics, those four features that I, that I thought would be useful for the audience today. Looking at the market size, of course, you know, we are talking about um, uh, you know, the longevity economy, which is the underlying sector where age tech, tech fits in, I think we're talking about 20 trillion in GDP per year. So if you compare this with the financial services, which gave the rise to FinTech, which is about 11 trillion, is actually bigger than the underlying basis for FinTech. And yes, FinTech has become a very quickly, um, uh, very quickly a huge vertical. So that is, you know, a good news uh, I would say for, for, for um, elderly, there is a market that businesses can untap. Uh, can untap. There, is, there is a diverse number of players um, because we are talking about companies uh, with whom we interact daily. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Airbnb, all of those are being increasingly interested in, in age tech. Also, the recent trend in investing in age friendly cities is quite a fundamental enabler, as I was saying before. So we see the emergence of an enabling environment for that, and also the emergence of a strong innovation collateral, because we are looking into new frontiers that are all involved in age tech, from cloud tech to robotics, automation, AI, and so on. So the concluding part of my presentation here is really on the, on the implication, because yes, it's a great business opportunity, but we are looking probably at a time to kind of update our social contract based on the new demographic, right? We're talking about two sides of the same coin. Businesses should foster and should adapt to dramatic changes in the way of thinking uh, of institution and consumers, but at the same time, that is the need to forge in that enabling environment for things that to, to happen. And so what do we need? But we have a lot of things that we need, but I try to, to focus on those four. First of all, we need to continue to devalue uh, to, uh, to value, I'm sorry, older workers that are often devalued across society. And I would say that actually this applies to young people too. Huh? In fact, I would even say that this is, uh, you know, it's right to talk about today's elderly, but this conversation is actually about me, about my kids, about their kids. It's really looking at changing the mindset and shifting the mindset, right? So we need, of course, integrated life course approach where all sectors or societies and the economy talk to each other. Education, pension, health, technologies, these are all pieces of the same puzzle, and they need to work in, um, in, in sync. Um, fostering autonomy and connectivity is, of course, paramount. We can see that even more and more uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, last but not least, we need to continue to highlight the opportunity for private capital and businesses because, of course, it's, uh, it's there 
that we can tap for new innovation. So that's my last slide here. And the question, you know, before everybody is, I'm sorry, is are we on the verge of an ethics transformation, right? So today we're talking about retirement, we're talking about preparation for the old age, we're talking about incentives only for the young people, we're talking about healthy aging ages, but actually the, we need bridges that actually lead, leads us to the world of tomorrow when we want to have a longevity culture, a life course continuum, a remaged aging and old age incentives, because actually the, 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 the message that we say, this is not just about old people, but it is about all people. It's where our world, hopefully free of COVID very soon, will be in the next uh, years to come. Thank you for, uh, for your time. Mario, thank you very, very much for your presentation. It is a presentation very rich of an optimistic point. In particular, I saw two points uh, that um, I, I saw that the politics starting to take aging seriously and also the millennials. I am very happy for the millennials. I have some doubts for the politics. <laughs> I hope, I hope. So, uh, no, I mean, uh, by all means, of course, uh, politics is always the slowest uh, wheel of the, you know, to uh, the slowest to, to catch up, uh, you know, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for, for laziness. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, what's happening in WHO with this uh, decade of anti-aging, which literally has started in the worst possible year. <laughs> um, but even not, you know, if you look at the other side of the coin with COVID, I think there is hope, right? There's going to be 10 years of increased advocacy on the, on the need of giving, you know, relevance and priority to this set of population. So, um, you know, you had the G20 talking about this. You have a mushrooming of organization. Um, so, you know, we, we have to keep optimistic, right? We need to be optimistic about something. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely agree. Thank you, Mario. You're welcome. And so, now we have to go to Boston by our friend Nicola Palmarini. And, ciao, Daniele. Uh, ciao, ciao. Probabilmente, probably, uh, we, you in USA, in USA now, we have the new president just in this moment. No? I can't say that. <laughs> I spent <laughs> the, last, the last three nights waiting yes, for results. Yes, I just want to knock on wood. Yeah, I have some information that is very, we are very near. I bet so. <laughs> I am okay. The, the floor is yours, Nicola. Th th thank you, Daniele. And, you know, uh, thanks to Mario, Sofia, uh, Jerome. I think uh, coming as the last, there's many things that have been said before by my colleagues, but I think they all presented wonderfully what is probably the big point that I'm, I'm going to, to discuss with you. Give me a second as soon as I can share my screen. If you see it, do you see it? Yes. Okay, so um, uh, I'm Nick Palmarini, I'm the director of UK National Innovation Centre for Aging, which is based in Newcastle, north of England, not in London. And I just wanted to highlight this point because uh, in England, uh, if you were talking about politics before, I think it's important to uh, realize there are some governments which think that the aging uh, or the longevity economy opportunity is something that belongs to uh, the business trajectory of a nation. England has put 2.5 billion pounds on, on the plate to, to develop a four stream of innovation and research. One is um, self-driving vehicles, artificial intelligence, climate change, and aging. So there is a mandate from the government to, to uh, provide the funding for research and innovation to reach a very tangible target. UK has the mission by 2035, so literally 15 years from today, to add five years of healthy uh, life, five years more of healthy life to the British citizens, which I think gives you the flavor. There are some countries in this world which are taking this opportunity. And the fact that the center I lead is based in the north of England, it's following some attempts uh, from countries like it happened in Italy when we try to invest more uh, budget in areas like Friuli or Basilicata, and whose Italian knows what I'm talking about, the north of England is one of the areas that suffers from the magnet of the south, which is London, Cambridge, and Oxford, which attracts, I think, 70, 80% of funding and investment. So the idea is just also to promote innovation 
in some areas of the country, and the northeast of England is one of these, where also some demographic, demographic factors like aging and the economic power of the population are there are very different than from the south. So we literally are living in one area and developing our research in one area where you have a certain demographic and a kind of economic power of this demographic, which is slightly different from the average that you can find in the south of England. So quickly, my, my journey today is just taking advantage of what we heard before. But I invite you to do this exercise, Daniele, if you want to do it every time you're talking about aging. First thing you do in the morning, go to Google and then click and search for aging and problems or aging and opportunities. Basically, these are the records that you get, okay? And this is what I did literally uh, 35 minutes ago. And you see that we have 1.2 billion records about the world aging associated with problems compared to opportunities. I think Mario and Jerome talked about this opportunity very, very well. So I don't have to spend the time over this. I just go to three semantic things that I guess are affecting the, um, the issue we have not to take all this opportunity. The first one is, is the adverb already versus still. We still think that uh, there is a transition from when you already can do something until you still doing something. Oh, you already walking or you still walking. And I think we're in this mood in which we still think that older adults are doing something, expecting that they won't do it uh, anyway or anymore because we think they have to die. That's the first one. The second one is about should versus make. I think we have a lot of fantastic research that has been developed in the last 50 years uh, that are telling us that aging is a malleable process. But we keep on saying, oh, they should do this, or they should do that, or they shouldn't do this. And in the Liguria region, Daniele, you know very well that we have been told you should not do this because you are, okay. Well, I think it's time that we just take the opportunity and make it happen. So one of the key points about what I'm going to say is how to make it happen, what Mario uh, uh, and Jerome said before uh, as an opportunity. And finally, I think there is a point about them versus us. It's just like we're talking always about someone else while it's talking about ourselves. So I think if we start thinking about ourselves as part of the process, I guess we can really understand what, what we are talking about. Because the us we have in mind, and again, this narrative that typically is top of mind of all of us, is older adults are this kind of thing, or this kind of people. While I think there is a, also a different older adult, what about this guy, which is 90, and I know very well because he's my dad, and it's just a normal person like everyone else. Or we have an idea about women this way in their aging process. What about these women? Where are they? They're just around us. If you just go downtown Genova where you are, you will find people dressed this way. They want to live, have fun, has a style. They're themselves. Also, there is uh, this kind of interesting evolution about how the style is following the mood, and the mood here is the COVID. But you don't give up of being who you are. I think the picture in the middle tells a lot about the fact that despite of the situation, we are individuals, we are, our, we are ourselves, we want to be ourselves. Also, there are these kind of women. I know tomorrow morning you're going to talk about this movie. There is a session dedicated to this one. I just wanted to mention because we as a center are supporting this movie. And it's important that we, we do it because we have the responsibility to change the narrative we don't all only have to say to someone else, you should change the narrative. We have to do it. And whoever is in the, uh, in the sector where can uh, physically make this uh, narrative to change, have the responsibility to do it. And Daniela, I thank you for inviting us because you are doing these things with the session we're doing today. What about our center? This is basically the, the, the overall mission. Uh, we are harnessing the business opportunities related to the longevity economies. Let me underline for a second the plural. It's not a singular. I don't trust the idea of the longevity economy as a sector. There are many economies that are serving the process of aging of people, but it's something that it's not specifically one vertical sector. Why it's not that way? Because if you go to, to talk with some big brands, uh, for example, Microsoft or IBM, and you tell them there is a longevity economy sector. They don't see it because they see transportation, housing, mobility, and whatsoever. So it's important, I think, we also engage the businesses following their languages. We do it through human experience, ethic data, collaboration, emerging technology, innovative business models. Let me say, it's something quite obvious, 
because the mission we have is just to transform somehow of the obvious in something tangible. That's what we did. So we shape uh, our mission, and I think it's one of the few times in life where we've been able to make a mission that is four words long. So what we want to do, we want to add intelligence to aging and longevity. And you see on the right, we're also developing a manifesto around it. Why we're saying so? Because we think we're lacking a layer of intelligence that um, uh, all the speakers before me identified. There is a lot of intelligence out there. There's a lot of knowing, uh, knowledge, understanding, data. But how we can translate that layer of information and knowledge in something actionable, we think adding a layer of intelligence. Now, what type of intelligence are we talking about? And this is the business chart about how we are approaching the concept of aging intelligence that we framed as a paradigm and we trademarked it. So it's our paradigm around which we're building solutions that I'm going to talk in a second. We see three layers of intelligence. The, the bottom left is the intelligent, intelligence as, of us as humans. So we are people with experience, understanding, knowledge. We have an incredible capability of providing the change in all our stages of life. Can we harness that intelligence? So collected that intelligence and transforming data that can be used by others. The second is the intelligence on top. And again, it's the intelligence that's been showed before. There's a lot of solutions. There's a lot of research. My center is embedded inside Newcastle University and the university is connected to a network of universities. We, as many others, produce an incredible amount of intelligence on all the sectors, uh, from biomarkers to transportation, from climate change to changing the shape of housing, okay? All that knowledge and all what the big companies are doing is an intelligence that most of the time is not harnessed for the older adults. It's mainly very vertical, dedicated to certain targets, which typically we don't understand how this be, could be beneficial for other um, users. Finally, what we're trying to do is just collect these two previous intelligence physically, leveraging what the business is today. It's data and platforms. So we are trying to collect the intelligence and transforming in sort of an actionable insight that all the companies could take advantage of. Talking about the, the economies, uh, we are divided, uh, our approach in these eight verticals. Uh, which are pretty obvious, okay? It's something, not, no, no news there. What I think it's interesting is the horizontal. So whenever we develop a business and a project or an engagement with a client, we go through these four dimension. The first one is obvious. We would like to promote solutions that makes people living better for longer. The second is not so obvious, and, and thanks that you remarked it before, and Jerome said it. We want to do business in an ethical way. That doesn't mean only that we want to treat equally the people doesn't mean we just want to promote the solutions that are uh, available to everyone. Also means that the data you collected should have to be treated ethically. The third point is about the narrative, but you see the movie I showed before, and many other actions we're doing is just promoting a new narrative. And finally, there is climate change, which is a, a, a fact that is happening to the planet that is so strongly connected to, to the process of aging. You see that these four dimensions are generating something on the right. We call it the return on society which is an index that we're building to, to suggest how companies, while having return on investment, can also have an impact on society. You see in this chart, technology is not uh, uh, anywhere because technology is the fabric that stays in the background. I think we don't even have to say that technology is relevant. Technology is like the toilet paper today, because if you think about COVID, people started buying toilet paper, and it's hard to understand why so much toilet paper, but in the same time, they just were building bandwidth, technologies, uh, uh, iPads, all these kind of things, which is part of our daily life. Um, we have one asset in the center, which is very important. It's a community of 8,565 uh, plus individuals. We physically have a community of people we engage and embed in whatever we do. So formally, whatever we design, it's made together with the people, which means that we can harness that intelligence I was talking before, not just by, by chance, but just by design. And one thing we are doing is just bringing to the table, not only the older adults, aging is not a matter of 60, 80, 90. It's a matter of all the life stages, mainly before, because there's a lot of interactions between people who's aging and their family members. So if I design a solution for my father, that solution probably is more relevant for me than for my father, because me, I'm the one 
supporting him. And his desire and my desire are probably different. So we have to understand what are these desires. Uh, six example, and, and then I'm done. So I just wanted to show you how we are translating all the things that I explained before. First of all, the building where we are in Newcastle, which is a new building, has been fully designed with the community I mentioned before. So all the solution from the button in the elevators, the path to reach the rooms, the workshop room you see bottom left has been done together with the community of older people so that we can understand better how to live and work in a place that can support the life of older adults. The second is a project which I keep on mentioning every time. It's kind of simple and complex at the same time. We fully designed from scratch a new bench to put in the city. If you come to Newcastle, you will see these benches that I see, I'm showing here uh, almost everywhere in the city. And that has been designed fully from the idea up to the building from the center, meaning that we can also start processing from zero when there is a request from a business entity, in this case, the Newcastle City Council, to design a specific object that could serve a multi-generational uh, community, not only the older adults. Um, We're developing a, a project with this company that has invented a new system of cooking, which is try to preserve proteins as much as possible, but not only, just helping you to cook using less energy. So climate change, ethical sustainability, and nutrition are coming together. We're working with uh, Virtualit to design a new uh, set of interaction system to help people uh, be entertained, but while you're entertained, you can collect the data about your uh, brain performances. We have developed a system of VR to help the travelers to understand more about what's happening in their next travel. And you see at the bottom, the lady is saying, we are the generation that's got the money to travel and the time to do it. So we need a tool for us, not for only for others. We're working with a company called On Hand, which has one of the most well-designed applications to engage volunteers to serve the older adults who need informal care. And with them, we help to change the business model. Instead of making a fee to be paid by the users, we involved the brands, in this case, as a bank in the north of England, to sustain the business so that the, the city council could relieve some of the issues of the budget that they have through COVID. We're developing a system of helping people to work easier using an exoskeleton, which is embedded in the fabric of trousers. And this idea of supporting pedestrians is also done with Piaggio. So we are working with Piaggio Fast Forward, which is the spin-off of the Piaggio that we all know, which is developing a sort of a walking robot that helps people to load and bring the grocery because this type of robotics has the, the power to uh, hold 23 kilos of, of, of things, of grocery, so that they are helping people who are walking in their daily life, um, leveraging a, a, a new concept of, of robotics, which we think it's an interesting way that we don't know if it will be the society of tomorrow. But if we don't test it and we don't put it in practice, we will never be able to make that economic will to start so that others can understand what can be delivered to older adults. If you want to know more, I wrote a book uh, on this topic on the right, but it's in Italian. So I suggest you to look the one in English on the left, which has a lot of interesting feedback from researchers, economists, sociologists all over the world about what artificial intelligence and data can help us to achieve in the process of aging. Finally, my point is the William Gibson point. I'm nobody compared to him, but what he says is something very important. The future is here. The point is that it's not evenly distributed yet. That's our mission to make it happen. Instead of talking about it, let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nicola. Thank you. It's great your presentation and, and very great all, all, the, all the panel because the discussion began with the word loneliness. For the silver, uh, for the silver people, and now we are speaking about multi-generation and, and islander, and so I, I think that uh, is a conclusion very, very optimistic, and very, very interesting. It's important, in particular, don't forget to uh, the major part of the silver people that uh, don't have the opportunity to live to this level that. Uh, um, you present uh, uh, you present us in, in, in the three presentation 
obviously that we have a part, and you know very well in Italy, for example, we have a large part of the people that don't have all the possibility, the, the, as the, the women that live in Florida with the rich, rich, um, rich men. So, but it's important to have a vision. And so uh, thank you for your presentation because it give a vision, it give an, an, an idea very optimistic of this uh, silver, silver idea, silver age. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I would like, Jerome, do we have some other things to to edit in this uh, in this debate? No, it's uh, it's quite it's very interesting. Uh, may, maybe a few maybe a few golden rules. Uh, first of all, uh, universal design. We talk about that. Design for all is design for all. Oh, okay. uh, another golden rule is no ghetto. We have to to, to have uh, an international in, inter sorry, intergenerational thinking point of view. Uh, another golden rule could be please start with changing your point of view regarding your own aging well before explaining to other how to aging well because it's really important for us. Another golden rule could be your grandmother does not represents the market because seniors are the most heterogeneous target we can find. Okay. And we talk about no ethics, no business. And by the end, maybe silver economy is not transhumanism. I don't know if you know what I mean. It's not the same ID. Uh, the ID is not to kill the death. Uh, the ID is to aging well. Okay. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Thank you too. Ma Mario, do you have underlined something? More. Um, I think this is. I agree. This is great. I mean, the only thing I would say is that the. Um, I think that what, one point on the COVID that I didn't. I wasn't able to to do that before is that uh, COVID is. In, I mean, it's teaching us a lot of things, but it's teaching also the importance of maintaining healthier and more vital bodies. Um, because you know, as we age, of course, we need to build protection against this this um, threat. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because we are looking into, um, uh, how to say, right now, loneliness, um, you know, emargination, uh, marginalization of, uh, of elderly, it's a concern worldwide, even I'm based in Switzerland, and actually a recent survey was actually saying that there was a lot of cross-generation discussion, but overall the trend is that, you know, we are going to have people more isolated and, and less connected. So we really should invest into, um, you know, um, uh, digital liter literacy for, for elderly uh, to, to create multi-generational workforce also in the healthcare, uh, in the healthcare facilities. Because uh, we need to create those conditions for keeping the people, right, active and uh, included in, in society uh, as much as we can. And I think COVID has only exacerbated that need. So I just wanted to make that point. Uh, thank you, Mario. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that in, in uh, Switzerland it's very easy, this multi-generational uh, situation, but in, in Italy we have to do some uh, more steps to reach uh, this, uh, this goal because it's not so, it's not so, so easy to have this multi-generation. But I, I would like to close this debate with Sofia no, and Nick. Daniele, Daniele. Uh, sì. Irina collegata, Irina Calderon. Ah, ok. Non la vedo, però non vedo nessuno qua. Irina? Ah, ok. Hi, Irina, good afternoon. Do, Can you hear me? Do you hear me? Can... Yes, now, yes. Ok. I, 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 I give you the word if you want. Would you like to... Oh, well, do you have a... Oh. Ah, now I, I see you. Ok. Welcome, Irina. Yes, Welcome. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, yes, yes you... I, in, in fact, I have prepared a presentation, but I'm not sure how long uh, do I have now. Not, not two hours, only 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> only 10 minutes, okay. Good, uh, let me then load it and I'll try to shorten when I am uh, too long, so. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah. Can you see it right now? 
you can, yeah, yes, yes. You can use only the optimistic part about your presentation. Uh, I, I am very optimistic, so. Uh, okay, perfect. Yeah. So good afternoon, everybody, and I, I listened to all your interventions, which are very interesting and very relevant to the to our work in the Commission. So just a very quick introduction. I am a policy officer in the unit uh, eHealth, Wellbeing and Aging in DigiConnect, um, where we have plenty of different policies, but uh, today we would uh, concentrate on what we do regarding demographic change. Um, yes, I would like to quickly go through um, very recent developments. Uh, the Commissioner um, for Demography and Democracy, um, Ms. Schwitzer, she took uh, to her portfolio a very important work uh, to promote um, active and aging uh, policies. And um, in this respect, uh, the Commission published um, a report on demographic change this June with the most recent updated data on how regions, European regions age because um, the differences are, of course, more linked into regions than into member states as such. Um, very quickly I would present this uh, because um, uh, we, we have a very few time. We are expected, as you already know, to live longer and longer and in 50 years. Um, we uh, over 65 years um, population would represent more than one third of the whole European population. Very interestingly, the population over 80 uh, is expected to grow to 13 percent. We are talking about a very large part of uh, the European population. Um, other findings, uh, we have fewer children, this is no, not new to you. We live in ever-changing households, um, either without children or alone or monoparental households. This has an impact on demographic change as well. We also move from one region to another region, very often from a less prosperous region to a um, more rich one for better work opportunities, leaving behind regions with a lack of skills and lack of opportunities as well. And last interesting finding is that the European population as such is shrinking uh, and we would represent um, a smaller and smaller part uh, with regard to the rest of the world population. Um, the, we are working now in this moment on a green paper on active aging, which is um, going to be published in January next year, and on a long-term vision on rural areas, again, because aging population uh, is often left behind in rural areas and this has an impact on uh, long-term care and on all kinds of other structures and functioning also of rural areas. Um, the important part of, uh, maybe the important um, thing that you, you would have to recall is that we are also taking uh, into consideration a life uh, course approach because we start aging once we are born. And what is it that we as um, citizens and human beings will have to acquire as skills in order to be able to remain active, healthy, and um, to be able to also contribute to this society, whether economically, but also socially, as long as, as possible. And this would require a lot of different reforms, not only pension reforms, but 
also educational reforms and, of course, health-related and social-related reforms. Um, I would like to also uh, bring uh, shortly the attention that um, the German presidency, which is currently um, uh, currently the presidency of the European uh, Union has adopted uh, council conclusions on human rights, participation and well-being of older persons in the era of digitalization just uh, around three weeks ago. And uh, among the different um, recommendations given both to member states and to the Commission, digitalization of health and care provision is, uh, takes a very big part. But I, um, I, would, uh, I would prefer to continue my presentation and if you would have uh, the interest, um, look deeper into the different uh, conclusions and recommendations given to member states. Um, okay. Very quickly, um, the European Commission has been working on uh, different policies to promote active and healthy aging with the help of digital technologies for more than a decade now. And uh, three years ago, it also published its Silver Economy Strategy. I would not go back through all the different findings uh, because you have mentioned them in your interventions, but uh, we see silver economy as a huge opportunity for a growing health tech set industry, both for skilled um, and young people and innovators, but also for uh, low skill uh, people, uh, people with low, quali uh, low qualities who could uh, better reskill themselves and contribute to the society. And uh, the, we see the aging process and people um, who are getting older as an active participant in the society who could continue their uh, second, third or fourth career after they retire or choose not to retire but to work less. So those are all reforms that the Commission is trying to convene to member states um, and we hope that they would take them up. Um, we have our uh, Director General, DigiConnect, and um, other services of the Commission. We have supported different programs, so the Active and Assisted Living Program, AEL program, which is a partnership of public funding agencies uh, and the Commission, and we support um, the older adults' quality of life through the uptake of digital technology-based solutions on a very local and regional level. And we also have supported and continue to support the European Innovation Partnership on Active and Healthy Aging. Its initial um, goal when it was launched in 2011 was to increase the healthy lifespan years um, of uh, people by uh, two years, and this has been reached uh, in 2019. But very interestingly, it also created uh, very big um, communities. We call them reference sites, but reference sites is um, signifies an ecosystem, regional ecosystem, where all the different actors needed to deploy a solution work and commit themselves to do so. So this means um, bringing together health and care providers, innovators, administration, and also patients and citizens, because um, the co-creation process is very important and adapting uh, each solution to the exact need is, uh, is the only way to go if a digital health solution should work. Um, yes. Irina. I wanted also to mention, yes? <laughs> no, no, it's okay, it's okay, let's go. Take the time. Yeah, yes, we have... <laughs> 
we have um, also supported okay. um, twinning schemes. Twinning schemes mean, means exchange of best practices. For example, okay. when when a region has adopted um, a, ver a very good digital solution successfully, the Commission can support the exchange of best practices on how this has been deployed and adopted in another European region. Um, where is this all actually um, embodied in the European Commission policies? In the whole overall strategy of um, how to promote digital health and care uh, in the European Union. And this strategy um, encompasses quite a lot of different pillars, uh, but um, we could very quickly summarize them as, uh, for example, um, one, uh, how to um, achieve a secure access and exchange of health data, such as electronic health records, across borders, but those are also aspects on how to make sure that our data is secure and aspects related to cyber security and privacy. Um, we have also, with our second priority, worked towards pulling data together because we know that data exists all over uh, the Union uh, in different institutes in different projects in different health and care facilities and it is important that this data could be pulled together in order to improve um, treatments and to provide better personalized medicine and our third bigger and probably biggest priority is to empower citizens to take care of their health status um, individually, independently, with the help of digital tools and technologies. Those, um, in this respect, um, we are talking about very different things. Those could be um, projects related to age-friendly environments and independent living. Um, those could be projects related to robotics. Those can be also projects related to helping older working, older employers to adapt their work um, space, but also work um, phase and rhythm to um, better to their um, age, but also for employers to use information on how to better adapt um, the working conditions of older people uh, and make sure that they could continue to work longer. Um, of course, many different solutions and um, assistive um, coaches on how to help older people to live independently in their home and to have a better um, well-being um, with different platforms and solutions with which they could interact, for example. Um, and other solutions on how to make sure that carers, whether formal or informal carers, could use digital technologies to monitor very old people, like, uh, for example, how to situate them if they are lost, but also how to, of course, interact with them um, easily. And we yeah, have also supported... We have, we have to go in, in the conclusion. Sorry. We have to go and um, the conclusion. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, very quickly then. Um, okay. Conclusion. We, the Commission has uh, taken, um, has promoted um, active and healthy aging with different policies, projects, and 
research and innovation. But it is also very much aware of the problems when reaching the market, and uh, we are working towards creating a sustainable ecosystem, European ecosystem for the digital health industry. Um, in our future work, as you know, we have a new budget for the coming seven years, deployment and adoption of those um, digital solutions would play a crucial role because we have witnessed that uh, unfortunately, 90% of the research and innovation technologies for, are not successfully deployed. Um, and you could have my slides later on, but the conclusion is that um, the Commission would, of course, continue to support the uptake of technologies for um, citizens, patients, um, also in the coming seven years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irina, for your presentation. With uh, your project, RAM Chip Smart Beer Activate, we are entering the future. And so thank you very much. You're welcome. So, uh, okay. So uh, I think that uh, we, we conclude our international session. And I would like to thank so all the speakers. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, um, Nicola, uh, Sophie, and Irina. Okay. Um, and uh, I uh, thank you for your very interesting presentation, very optimistic presentation. I can only say you take care and cross your finger about the pandemic development, please. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much bye. for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. And thank you for that.